Hi, everyone. I'm Saad Omar. I'm the director of the Yale Institute for Global Health. I'm really delighted to welcome you to the uh, Global Health Conversation Series, uh, in addition to the Yale Institute for Global Health, or YGH. The series is co-sponsored by the Walker Fund at the Macmillan Center at Yale. Well, a lot of you probably know that eradication of disease is de defined as a deliberate um, set of efforts towards a permanent reduction to zero uh, of the worldwide incidence of infection caused by a specific agent. The eradication efforts require enormous planning and effort and implementation and dedication. Uh, the, the eradication of smallpox, uh, the, the only human disease that has been eradicated so far, uh, was spearheaded by the smallpox eradication program launched uh, by the World Health Organization in 1976. Uh, th th this multi-pronged initiative focused on endemic countries and utilized a combination of surveillance, case finding, contact tracing, ring vaccination, uh, and communication campaigns to inform affected population. Uh, fueled by uh, worldwide support by 1973, the number of countries with the smallpox uh, had substantially decreased. With the last infection reported in Somalia on uh, October 26, 1977. Uh, so WHO team searched for possible smallpox infections in the next couple of years, finding no further cases. And at the 20, uh, 33rd World Health Assembly in 1980, so approximately um, uh, 42 years ago, smallpox was officially deemed eradicated. Uh, to reflect this momentous effort and, and, um, to, to, and discuss eradication in the context of the present and, future, and the future, well, I'm so pleased to have with us Dr. William Fagey, or Dr. Bill Fagey, the former chief, chief of smallpox uh, eradication program and a former director of the CDC uh, between 1977 and 1983. Uh, as uh, in his leadership role within the uh, smallpox eradication program, Dr. Fagey pioneered the technique known as the surveillance containment um, uh, developed to combat spread of smallpox in the face of vaccine shortages. So uh, it was, you know, public health is about, uh, you know, life giving you lemons and making lemonade. That was one useful lemonade uh, that helped us uh, eradicate. And this was a combination of both theoretical understanding of what was going on, but also applied public health. And I remain, as an infectious disease epidemiologist, I, I, I remain a fan of that approach that, that was very suitable for that disease. Uh, and, and so using this method, Dr. Fagey and his team was able to, uh, were able to play a major role in eradicating uh, an infectious disease for the first time in human history. Uh, subsequently, and that was just, um, you know, I think it's reasonable to say, you know, because we know the rest of the story, that was uh, the start of his career, if you will, if, if, if you look at the full trajectory. Um, he then went on to be uh, a legendary CDC director uh, in 77, uh, where he ser served for six years. Uh, he co-founded the Task Force for uh, Child Survival and Development, now known, now known as Task Force for Global Health played a major role in the development and evolution of the Carter Center, uh, provided invaluable advice at the beginning and the foundation of the Gates Foundation, and so on and so forth. He, he remains a professor uh, emeritus at Emory. And personally speaking, uh, one of the proudest uh, things in my career, for me personally, was to be uh, the second ever Bill Fagey professor uh, at Emory. And so that, that was an incredible honor. And, and as an aside, when I would teach my class and, and Dr. Fagey would lecture in that on smallpox, first of all, what I get for a vaccine class, we would have, he would be the only lecture, uh, lecturer, you know, who would have his own fan base in, in class. And there would be a line uh, for people taking, you know, initially old school photos, but incre increasing his selfies with him uh, and, and getting uh, uh, his book signed, uh, copies of his book signed. One of the most um, remarkable thing about Bill Fagey is that he's not only a scientist, but he is, if you, if I could say so, the original or one of the original social justice warriors in the sense, focusing on equity, 
as part of the core DNA of public health and global health. Before it was, uh, you, before we had labels uh, around these issues. And so it is my pleasure and honor uh, to talk to him uh, about smallpox eradication, but also having a forward-looking discussion of what are the implications on uh, future eradication efforts, future global health and public health efforts, and, and what are some of the lessons, um, you know, us mere mortals can, can learn from uh, giants like uh, Dr. Fagi. So welcome, Dr. Fagi. Thanks, Todd. Thanks for having me. Uh, thanks for being a professor at Emory. Thanks for bringing some glitter to my name. And uh, it's uh, good to be on this program. My pleasure. So the first question is simple. Is eradication worth it? Let me divide that into two things. One has to do with people and the other with money. For people, uh, think of the fact that WHO said in the 20th century, 300 million people died of smallpox. Since most all of them died in the first 75 years, that means there were 4 million deaths a year. And that is about as high as any disease. I mean, tuberculosis and measles were in that category. But 4 million deaths a year, plus 4 million people scarred for life. And so uh, from the personal point of view, it's worth it. Then you look at the money, and it's said that it cost about $300 million to eradicate smallpox. Half of this came from the United States. Well, the United States has recouped its investment every three months because of what it used to cost to treat people who had complications because of the vaccine who had died or the uh, fact that we had to have quarantine. So since smallpox has been eradicated, we have recouped our investment 130 times. Every dollar that was invested has come back with $130. So yes, uh, it's worth it. In many ways, we borrow from our children and when you look at climate change and what we've done to the plastic in the ocean and so forth, we're depending on our children and grandchildren to pay that off. Well, disease eradication is one way that we pay forward and we actually give a gift to our grandchildren. So yes, it's worth it. Wonderful. Uh, so, you know, um, we know, and, and those of us who have read your uh, sort of writings about it, um, you know, so smallpox eradication ran into roadblocks, uh, roadblocks um, and had areas of efficiency. So how many of those roadblocks or, or positive aspects are applicable in the current day? Uh, are there any new difficulties or new challenges or areas uh, that have improved um, since smallpox was eradicated? I think every day during the smallpox eradication program was a problem solving day. And we looked for people that had a record of being problem solvers. So uh, in, two, in 2020, we expected to have a meeting in Atlanta to celebrate 40 years since the WHO declaration. And as part of that, we were looking at what are the positive lessons that we learned from smallpox. Then the pandemic came along, we could not have that meeting. So instead, we continued to work on what are the lessons learned and could we put them into a curriculum, which we've done under the umbrella of becoming better ancestors, that would actually have something to say for today and tomorrow? So it so happened that we were looking at these lessons during the coronavirus pandemic. And it, I'm just going to go through the, the nine lessons we focused on very quickly to show you the, the difference between smallpox and coronavirus. Number one, lesson is this is a cause and effect world. And Stephen Hawking says this in his book, A Short History of Time, that the whole history of science is the gradual realization that things do not happen in an arbitrary way. It's a cause and effect world. And so on coronavirus, we have a president that says it's going to disappear like magic. Then a second lesson is you have to know the truth. And there were times when we did not want to know the truth. And I remember October of 1973, our first village to village search in India. And in just two states, 
we found 10,000 new cases of smallpox that no one knew existed in just six days time. And some people said, let's never do this again. But of course you have to do it again. It's the best surveillance you, you've ever had. So there are many times you don't want the truth, but you need the truth in order to continue. But a third lesson is you don't do anything alone. It requires coalitions. So in this country, we should have had for coronavirus, a coalition that went from national level that said, here are some guidelines and you can change these in states and cities and counties as you need to. But instead, uh, our government said to the state, you're all on your own. So compete, figure out this on your own and compete for resources. The, the next uh, lesson that we learned was avoid certainty. And Richard Feynman, the physicist said, physics is the most certain of sciences and it's uncertain. And he said, certainty is the Achilles heel of science. And of course it is of politics and religion and everything else. But we had so much certainty given by various people at press conferences on coronavirus. The fifth lesson, you have to continuously evaluate and change what you're doing. In India, this meant we had a meeting every month in endemic states to find out what worked last month, what didn't work, how do we change our tactics the next month. And in, in this country with coronavirus, we didn't have that kind of evaluation and, and changing of what was happening. A sixth lesson, respect the culture. And we know that if you go in with your ideas of how to do things, culture will always win. So if you tangle with culture, culture will win. You have to respect it from the beginning. The next lesson was the trade-off between science and management. The best decisions come from the best science. The best results come from the best management. So how do you put science and management together? The eighth lesson, you need political support. And this just becomes absolutely essential that you have politics involved. And many people have concluded after coronavirus, we don't want politicians involved in public health. That's absolutely the wrong conclusion that it's the politicians that decide on the money that we get. We need them to help solve the problems, become part of the solution, to be invested in the solution, rather than saying we want to separate ourselves from them. And the last lesson is, no matter where you live, you're both global and local. And so wherever you're practicing public health, you're practicing global public health. And the objective of global public health is global health equity. So everyone in public health is working on global health equity. Well, it, no one in public health even imagined in the midst of a pandemic that we would leave WHO. So all of this is to show how the lessons that we learned from smallpox were ignored, which leads to the 10th and last lesson. Lessons are useless if ignored. No, that's that, no very insightful, and, and uh, you know, a couple of things specifically strike me. Uh, you know, you can't public. You have to engage uh, our elected leaders, uh, especially in the democracies and even otherwise. But it doesn't have to be partisan. So political doesn't have to be partisan. And you've, you've shown, like you, you, and and several other leaders have been well respected on both sides of the aisle, um, and have been able to make the case for public health, which is obviously harder because as you have often said, uh, you know, public health is effective and nothing happens. Um, and so, so therefore, um, you know, it is challenging, but, but I think it's uh, doable. So switching gears a little bit, CDC has identified the, the virus that causes uh, sm uh, smallpox as, um, as a potential bioterrorism threat. In a changing world, where biological capacity is uh, increasingly available beyond a few specialized labs. And there are uh, perverse incentives for state and non-state actors uh, to engage in activities that are not necessarily ethical. How do we reduce and mitigate or you know, even eliminate the risk? I think bioterrorism with smallpox virus has been a concern right from the beginning. And 
particularly before the United States invaded Iraq. And there were questions about did Iraq have the virus and were they using it for research on bioterrorism? And in fact, there was a, a story front page of the New York Times saying they did have the virus that had been provided to them by Russia. And that it was a virus that could not you could not protect against with our current vaccine. Well, the administration came up with a plan to first vaccinate first responders, then they would go to 10 million beyond that. And then there, the question was, would they go to the whole population or not? The Institute of Medicine was asked to oversee that program. And I was asked to be a member of it, but I was told that we could not produce a report that criticized the administration. I was taken back by that. And I said, well, I can't be part of it then. Later they came and they asked if I would be a consultant if I was not able to vote or anything, and then I could say anything I wanted. And so I did do an op-ed piece for the Washington Post and pointed out if it's true that they have a virus that you cannot protect against with vaccine, why are we spending so much attention on vaccination in this country? And number two, why don't we realize that the, if there's a case, the problem in the United States will be panic. It won't be the disease itself, it'll be the panic. And the plan was that they could get to 10 million people in 10 days of vaccination. I said, if there were cases, we would have 300 million people trying to get in that line of 10 million. And it's the panic that would cause the problem. I proposed a solution to CDC and they didn't accept it. And so I simply put it as a one page summary in my book on House on Fire, which is very simple, that you look at the 3000 counties as the point at which we would respond to smallpox. We would in each county use the high schools as the point of vaccination. It's very easy to, to estimate how many people live in the catchment area of a high school. If you could tell the entire country, if need be, we could vaccinate everyone in three days time and that would prevent the next cases of smallpox, you could prevent the panic. You can train people in 10 minutes to do vaccination with a bifurcated needle. So we would know how many vaccinators we would need and we would get nurses, we would get teachers, we could volunteers and retired people. So you could line all of this up in advance. You could keep the vaccine at a national level and send it out overnight to 3000 counties if you had to. And once you can assure the country, everyone could be vaccinated in three, to three days time, you take away the panic factor. Now it's, it's relatively easy to do that with smallpox. It's much more complicated to do this with other agents. But we, could, we weren't even able, to, even able to come up with a reasonable response to smallpox. So you can see the difficulties of a response to other problems. No, that's, you know, that's an interesting, uh, uh, you know, point that you highlighted um, that, you know, things vary by, by pathogen, uh, but also that there are things uh, that you can do even about panic. And sometimes we um, are paralyzed by, by the potential fear of uh, public reaction, where we often forget uh, the, the basic principles of public health and public health communication. Uh, well, sort of, you know, in, in, in every other uh, school of public health or in every school of public health, um, there is a discussion um, in every semester about the value of vertical versus horizontal programs. Uh, you led one of the most vertical programs and then have worked on enhancing some of the most horizontal programs, um, et cetera. So, so you know, um, what are the implications of, of vertical disease specific programs versus, um, you know, horizontal programs and their impact on primary health care? So you can put vertical versus horizontal on any program and get people gathering in a room because there are strong feelings on both sides. And I came to a conclusion in the 1980s when I was uh, 
uh, president of the American Public Health Association for a year and had to give the keynote address. And so I decided to go back 100 years to see what they were discussing 100 years earlier at APHA. And to my total surprise, I found that the discussion was vertical versus horizontal. I thought that that was a fairly recent global health discussion. And here it went back 100 years. So I said to myself, well, in 100 years, what happened in this country? And it was very clear. Every time we had a tool, we used it, which is vertical. And every time we used it, we improved the infrastructure, which was horizontal. And that made it easier to take the next tool and include it. So it was always a ratcheting up of vertical, horizontal, vertical, horizontal. And so there should be no discussion of which is best. They're both needed. And uh, so, so we have to actually educate people in how to make that happen so that this doesn't become the argument. Yeah, no, you, you, you're right. And it, sometimes it's presented as a, as a kind of a false choice. Um, so switching gears a little bit again, and, and what have been some salient, um, you know, for lack of a word, uh, failures um, and, and successes and triumphs in the COVID-19 pandemic? It really was a triumphant tragedy. The tragedy I've just pointed out with the nine lessons that were ignored. The triumph is look at what happened with vaccines. I went back in my journal and found that the first note I ever made on messenger RNA was 25 years ago after hearing a lecture. And I wondered what would happen after that. So you see how long people have been working on that. For much of the public, they think that the work was just in the last year or two or three. And here it's been going on all the time. This was the triumph of coronavirus, a vaccine that came online so fast where you had government support. And the other part of this triumph is, you know, we have for the last 30 years averaged about one new disease problem a year. Each time we get excited about it, we get funds, and we think this is finally going to change the infrastructure of public health. And we are soon going to reach the same level as fire stations. That is, if a fire station and an airport doesn't have a disaster for 10 years, no one wants to reduce their budget. It, everyone understands you have to keep funding it. So we always think that's what's going to happen in public health. We'll get an infrastructure that is solid and continues on, and it never happens. I thought with coronavirus, for sure, this is going to happen. I no longer believe that that's going to happen. And we have to figure out how to make that actually happen so that it's part of the triumph of coronavirus. Yeah. Um, so in terms of um, the premier public health agency in, in this country, the CDC, what should the CDC look like after this pandemic is under control? Or, you know, while obviously um, it will take some time to bring the pandemic fully under control, we can start now. So what, what should be the future of the CDC? But th there are three or four things uh, that I th think of. You notice that the, the field of public health has continued to increase. It was pretty much infectious diseases when I started uh, and became interested in this 70 years ago. But it's then gone from occupational health to environmental health to chronic diseases to violence and injury. It, it keeps increasing. We still have a couple of areas that should be included. Mental health is one of them. It's been very hard to make this a public health issue, but it has to be because we have to have surveillance systems for mental health that we know who requires treatment and, and how to proceed. The other thing is, I think public health should be taking a lead on actually looking on health outcomes by the approach with clinical medicine. In this country, we are satisfied to reward people on the basis of process. So how many uh, tests are done for this or that and uh, how many pap smears and so forth, rather than on outcome. And it always surprises people to know we spend twice as much per capita as any place else 
and yet we're not in the top five or 10 or 15 or 20 countries when it comes to health outcomes. So that's one problem. Number two, I think we simply have to relook at what's the science, the technology, the uh, skills that are needed at CDC to keep it at the cutting edge of public health. They've taken a step by having a person from HHS now take a month to look at CDC and come up with suggestions. But we all know that things have become so political in this country that half the country will not accept what comes from inside HHS to CDC. And I think we need an outside group looking at the things I just mentioned of technology, skills, and so forth. And I would like to see the National Academy of Medicine do such a study. Number uh, three, I think that CDC should have a series of conferences with states, counties, cities, tribes, and ask the question, how do we get the approach to public health in this country as seamless as it was 40 years ago? Because 40 years ago, we had CDC had no more authority. They could not go in to a state and investigate an, out, uh, an out, uh, outcome problem. And they could not decide on who would do what in the state. They always had to ask for an invitation, but it worked. And why did it work? Because there was trust. And trust is the glue that keeps a coalition together. So we can get back to that, but it's gonna require a series of meetings with all of the people involved. It's a different time. When I was in the health department in Colorado, the health director in Colorado had been there 30 years. That doesn't happen anymore. People are there for two years and they change as soon as the governor changes. It's the same thing at CDC. I was CDC director under both Carter and Reagan. That, that, you can't see that happening again. But that's the next thing that CDC has to do is figure out how to make a seamless approach to this. And the last thing, I think they need uh, to get some outside consultation on communications. How uh, would it be best for health workers around the country? For instance, CDC puts out the morbidity mortality weekly report each week. They could send this to all health officers the night before with a brief on what are the complications to expect the next day. So everybody's looking at the same material. Uh, so there are things that could be done to improve and help CDC at the, this time. It's critical that we have a CDC. Yeah, no, the CDC is essential uh, for this country and, and, and globally uh, because of its global role as well. Uh, so you alluded to trust uh, in, in the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and you alluded to trust between institutions, you know, between the CDC and the states, et cetera, but there's a broader um, unfortunate problem of public trust in, in CDC, and it has been measured and it has declined. There was another period where the trust in CDC was dented a bit, uh, which was around the swine flu vaccine program in 1990, uh, 1976. Um, where, you know, there was this uh, alarm for a potential pandemic or a large outbreak. There was a vaccine program rolled out. There were some adverse events associated with the, with the vaccine program, uh, with the vaccine, uh, you know, uh, related to Guillain-Barre syndrome, which turned out to be true, but not at a level uh, where perhaps it changed the risk benefit risk, but there was, uh, you know, some lessons for communications and policy, et cetera. And, and I'm describing it not for you, obviously, you know this by heart. I'm, I'm just setting stage, the stage for those of us uh, who were doing other things uh, at that time, uh, like being in kindergarten. Uh, so <laughs> uh, I'm not that young, but you know, our audience is, uh, but, but um, sort of going back to sort of that period, Sort of in, in that contest, a context, but also beyond that, um, uh, any lessons on restoring public trust in the CDC? Well, uh, you're, you're right to point out my age because I was actually involved in that 
And I attended the first, Dave Sensor was the director of CDC, and I attended the very first meeting he ever had on this uh, with the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. It was an emergency meeting on a Saturday. And what was presented was three things have happened. We have a new virus. Number two, we have evidence of human to human spread at Fort Dix, New Jersey. And number three, there is no immunity in the population. Those three things had never happened before without resulting in a pandemic. And so it wasn't difficult for the group to say there's going to be a pandemic. The discussion, though, revolved around, do we, we have to make vaccine. Do we store the vaccine in refrigerators or do we store it in people? Well, if you store it in refrigerators, we know from experience that a flu outbreak can go across this country in two weeks time. If you vaccinate someone with a vaccine, it may take two weeks for them to get immunity. So there's really no way that you can justify waiting until you have spread of the virus before you start vaccinating. That's why there was a decision on vaccinating. It was not a decision made in isolation. The censor did not even take a vote of the committee that day. And I asked him afterwards, why didn't you? And he said, because this is gonna be a political problem. And he said, I need to absorb it rather than have the committee absorb it. But it went all the way to the Oval Office. And in the Oval Office with President Ford, with Censor presenting what we knew, they had in the group Salk and Sabin and some of the best virologists of the day and they all told Ford this was the thing to do. Then as soon as we ran into the first cases of Guillain barre suddenly people started jumping ship. And eventually it was only Dave Sensor who was being blamed for what had happened. The program was stopped because of Guillain barre and Sensor was fired by uh, Joseph Califano actually not by Califano, but by his deputy. And so that's how difficult the political situation is, was at that time. But, you know, CDC did not lose its credibility. And therefore, even though there was some reduction in the glue of trust, it all came back again. And uh, particularly with Legionnaire's disease and the solving of that problem that uh, the, the trust came back. At the present time, the trust, trust factor is really important because I see public health people not trusting each other. I see the public not trusting public health. And 30 years ago, I gave a talk at CDC and I was talking about how there are people who like Gandhi did the right things, but we don't know about them in history. But I said, there are also institutions that become Gandhian institutions and that CDC was one of them. But that reputation doesn't go on into the future. It has to be earned every day. And that's the challenge of CDC right now is to earn that reputation back every day. And I think it can be done. Interesting. So, uh, so we now uh, I'm taking some questions uh, from the audience uh, and, and those of you who are listening in, uh, please feel free to add your questions. Uh, so, so I already have a few questions. And, and the first one is, you know, will you please compare the eradication of smallpox to the effort uh, to eradicate uh, the, the guinea worm disease, uh, which was, um, you know, uh, which has been described, et cetera, including uh, you know, in the book by Don Hopkins and Ernesto Ruiz uh, Tiben, uh, I, I know that you have been engaged with uh, both individuals and institutions like the Carter Center, who have been at the you know forefront of the program. So, uh, any 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 lessons that uh, translated and any lessons that did not translate or transfer between the smallpox program. Uh, and the, 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 the guinea worm uh, disease program? First, I think all nine lessons do in fact transfer, but guinea worm had 
some problems and barriers that smallpox didn't. With smallpox, it was very hard to keep cases hidden because the disease was on the face and the hands. And uh, so people deliberately would hide cases, but it was hard, difficult. With guinea worm, the disease wasn't even known in the capital cities. It wasn't even known where you had the health department. And I think Nigeria turns out to be a good example of that, that they were reporting five or 6,000 cases of guinea worm a year. Well, that didn't seem like a very big problem. But there was a one-time survey done in Nigeria that showed at one point in time, almost 700,000 cases of guinea worm. And for those 700,000 people, it was hard to go to school. It was hard to work in the field. I mean, this really did cause a change in lifestyle, but Ministry of Health didn't know about this. But with that survey in Nigeria, the president of Nigeria, President Babangida, was so surprised by that result, he put up a million dollars in Nigerian money that day for guinea worm eradication. So it shows the need for political support and how do you get that kind of political support. They've also run into a problem, of course, with animals and particularly dogs that transmit guinea worm. We knew from the beginning that there was guinea worm reported in some animals, but it was always, it looked like a dead end, not something that went to humans. And now in Chad, there's some certain places where a lot of dogs have guinea worm. I think that this problem is going to be solved. There were only 15 cases of human guinea worm last year in the entire world, 15. I mean, compare that to the millions that we used to have. But here's the problem that we have to evolve faster than the organism does. In smallpox, that was always clear to me that the approach from the smallpox virus point of view had worked for centuries. And now we were evolving faster than the virus and the virus couldn't keep up. We have to do the same thing with guinea worm. Yeah, so, so you alluded to, you know, animal reservoirs, et cetera. And, and sort of when, when you do these tabletop exercises and when, when diseases are evaluated uh, for, you know, potential for eradication and a, and a big no-no, not, not, not an absolute no-no, but a big no-no is a, a existence of a human, a, a new human, non-human, sorry, um, reservoir. Uh, but, you know, look, we have been making investments in One Health. Uh, we have we are better at um, sort of measuring uh, infection and and pathogens in animals uh, as well as humans. Do you think it's time to be a little bit more audacious? Uh, is there room for audacity to say that this criteria is much softer or should be softer than 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 has been traditionally? Um, and can we be bold enough to look at uh, diseases that have animal reservoirs? Uh, for potential elimination or eradication? Absolutely. I mean, the when you look at the last 30 diseases that have come unexpectedly to our attention, 75% of them involve an animal or a vector. And yet, we do not do animal and human surveillance together at CDC or WHO until there's a specific problem. And then we do ad hoc animal surveillance. So we really have to figure out how to get the one world approach on surveillance. There, I haven't looked at this for some years, but I think there's only one place in the world that actually has what we used to call a class four lab for animals and a class four lab for humans in the same city. And that's Winnipeg, Canada. And it was by accident. I mean, two people that were interested, it wasn't part of a big plan. So we haven't approached this as a unit in the past, and we have to from now on. Yeah, um, so um, a couple of um, questions from, um, additional questions, a few other questions from the audience. And one I think is from a former uh, CDC person, uh, if, I, if I recognize the name correctly. Um, and, and they ask, you know, when will the CDC have a long-term uh, emergency response division, uh, a fixed team of professionals who are assigned to ERD 
full time. Obviously, there is some capacity in some organizational structures that are activated that are semi-permanent, but I think they're talking about something more permanent, more focused, and with dedicated resources. Interesting thing here, Saad, is we had that in the early 1980s, and people don't know that, but we had a program at CDC where we looked at each organism and asked the question, what would we do if we were trying to use this offensively? And therefore, what do we need to do to come up with a defense? This was with CDC and the FBI, with secure phones, fo phones secure rooms, and 24 hour a day people on call in order to be able to look at uh, a particular problem. I, I was so pleased what was, what was happening with this. When I left, this was presented to the uh, new director and his response was, oh, this will never happen. And he closed down the program overnight. So this was in CDC's history and it has to now be in CDC's, CDC's future. So, uh, so the next question, I'm actually combining uh, a couple of questions there. Uh, and when one of the, the questioner is uh, one of our uh, living legends, uh, Jerry Friedland uh, here at Yale, uh, who was, uh, did some, has been doing and has did, did some pioneering work um, in the early parts and subsequent parts of the HIV uh, epidemic. Um, I'm, I'm combining a couple of questions there. So, so uh, could you please comment on the ongoing concurrent global pandemics of TB and HIV in the context of the rapid COVID-19 pandemic? And what lessons can be learned, and especially, uh, and then the related part is that, that in terms of the, the role of the CDC, you had just left the CDC uh, when HIV came uh, to four uh, in terms of uh, a, an epidemic and then eventually became a pandemic. So any thoughts on HIV AIDS uh, from the early days and the response to that, and then what are the implications uh, of for of COVID nineteen and the current situation on the, on the on these uh, global pandemics of TB and HIV AIDS? Well, as you know, Saad, I'm not smart enough to answer these questions, but I, I will give you a top of the head feeling. With HIV, uh, it took quite some time, didn't it, before people saw this as a global problem. I mean, I remember those days in Africa where uh, medical people, uh, teachers, uh, missionaries were dying faster than they could be replaced. And you just had no idea where this was going to go. And it had to be seen as a global problem before we could get global solutions. Uh, Will Durant used to say, that we will never do things on a global level unless we fear an alien invasion. And it struck me one day that we have surrogates for an alien invasion and HIV eventually became one of those surrogates for an alien invasion. And so I think one of the great things that George W. Bush did was to put huge amounts of money into a global approach to HIV. And we've got to credit him for having done that. But we should be very careful in public health to do other things as surrogates for an alien invasion. It's what probably led to smallpox eradication because everyone knew smallpox was a threat, even if they hadn't seen it for a while. In this country, we had not had a case since 1949 and yet the U.S. participated because they saw this as a threat to the U.S., not just to other countries. And so that's part of what we need to do in public health is to show how things are a threat globally and how they become a surrogate for an alien invasion. Coronavirus, uh, it, 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 it hurts a lot to see how we did not respond globally the way we should have. Uh, the Gavi actually had an approach to the global program where they had a lot of buy-in, but they couldn't get the vaccine at first. And 
much of the enthusiasm then started disappearing. But we have to, again, say every place we are is both local and global, and that our job is global health equity. Yeah, and so coming to another question, so why are the public health systems in the U.S. so fragmented? Um, and, you know, there are obviously state, county, and federal levels, but there are different policies in different states. Obviously, that's part of it is a feature of the system of governance in this country. It's, it's you know, uh, because constitutionally, the police powers of the states, uh, which include quarantine powers and all sorts of other stuff, um, resides within the states, not at the federal government level, although there's some uh, sort of limited exercise of that. But we could do so. Uh, we could align um, them better. You know, we managed to, with the same constitutional and legal infrastructure. We we managed to have, a, for example, a working uh, interstate highway system. Uh, public health remains fragmented, um, and and so so so. Any thoughts on that? And as I mentioned before, uh, we did not need more authority because. We had so many people from CDC who were actually working in states. We had so many state people who had taken part of their training at CDC that this trust factor was different at that time. It's become politicized since then because every state governor has their own health advisor now and they, they switch a lot. But I think we can get back to that by figuring out what is required to make this seamless? What do states need from the federal government to make this happen? And so I haven't given up on the idea that we don't need more authority, we need more trust. And perhaps more money. And if I can, you know, one thing I have heard you say a few times, if I can, and I heard you quote Dolly Parton a few times, that it takes money to look this cheap, uh, if I'm paraphrasing that correctly. She we, said you'd be surprised how much it costs to look this yeah, cheap. Exactly. <laughs> so yeah, exactly. You said it right. Uh, and so, um, and, and we don't invest enough. Uh, uh, you know, there, there are high returns in, on investment uh, on uh, of, of public health, and, and we still don't take, as a country and as a world, don't take the rational decision of investing uh, in, in public health. So in terms of, you know, we talked about bioterrorism, et cetera, and there's a direct question from the audience, which says like, should the smallpox virus in the, in, in the two labs in Atlanta and Moscow be destroyed? And, and uh, you know, uh, I, I would say that that's a naive assumption, if I may, that it is only in two labs. Uh, they are undeclared, uh, but, but confirmed uh, reserves. Cor correct me if, if I'm, uh, my interpretation is incorrect, but still it's limited. Um, uh, sort of uh, um, places where, where, where the virus exists. Uh, uh, do you think it's too big a threat uh, to uh, have, have the virus even present in those two places or, or other places as well? So one has to look at um, what is the threat if we would unilaterally destroy smallpox virus in this country? And the vaccine is not made from the virus. So we don't need the virus in order to make vaccine. The vaccine is a, a, a different virus. Uh, it's hard to see any advantage to keeping the virus because uh, we, have, we now have the uh, genetic code of every strain of smallpox virus. And we know that it's probably possible to recreate this if someone wanted to. I see no advantage for keeping the virus in either place. And I see no advantage to keeping it in this country if Russia refuses to destroy theirs. So uh, I would say we should destroy our virus because I can't see any advantage to having it. Okay. Um, so there's another question and I'll take the liberty of sort of modifying it a little bit. Um, how do you see the role of WHO, uh, you know, in, in, in conjunction with CDC, but also as a uh, as an entity that needs to evolve with the public health threats? Uh, how do you see the role of WHO going forward? I always tell people WHO is absolutely essential. If we didn't have it, we'd have to create it. And so the real question is, how do we improve it? And uh, Unfortunately, the United States was involved in making it as weak as it is 
because when it was created, we insisted on strong regional offices because we were trying to protect Pajo. And so the regional offices are strong enough they can undermine Geneva anytime they want to, and apparently they often want to. And so with Ebola in 2016, the, the first big fight was between WHO Geneva and WHO Afro on who's in charge. The one thing they agreed on, don't call in CDC. <laughs> and so this is a problem because we made WHO weaker than it needed to be. Then what do we do? We give them a board of directors of 193 ministers of health. And there's no one that would accept a job at a company in the United States with a board of directors of 193, 195 people. And third, we joined the course every year telling them to reduce their budget. And that's where the Dolly Parton quote comes in, that we, I said, we will finally learn how much it costs to look this cheap. And I think 2014 in Africa with Ebola, we got our answer. And we need to support WHO so it has the same sort of resources and abilities and technology that the world needs to have a strong uh, public health institution. Absolutely right. And I think that as we will look back on 2020, uh, we will finally account for the consequences of the U.S. pulling out and being antagonistic towards WHO. So, so you refer to COVAX, or you alluded to COVAX, that the system that was created to provide vaccines. There were no takers. Uh, you know, initially, uh, they didn't have the money and they didn't have the backing from the from big countries like the U.S. who were going, uh, you know, who were working against the interests of COVAX and WHO. And so that, that gap created, uh, you know, such the gap in interest and funding and, and, and effort created such vulnerabilities. And, and I would submit that we are still paying the price yep. in terms of increased risk of variants, uh, et cetera. Um, so, uh, you know, one of my colleagues is asking that there are a lot of stories of smallpox eradication that includes uh, you know, the stories from specific countries. Somalia, for example, comes up uh, a few times um, as one of the last places uh, with smallpox. Uh, and, 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 and India was, you know, part of the story of, uh, of polio and Pakistan and Afghanistan and, and Nigeria, etc. So what are the implications of global health governance uh, of outbreaks and relationships between countries and international bodies? Because yes, so the, even if you set aside uh, WHO, um, Afro, uh, there was a sort of a delicate dance with, with the countries and, and you had firsthand experience dealing with countries, both from within, uh, based on your deployments, but, but in your WHO and CDC roles as well. Well, the interesting thing was that we were able to do this with the Soviet Union during the Cold War. And so in India, I actually supervised some people from the Soviet Union who in turn supervised Americans. Now you can't imagine that happening in any other structure at that time during the Cold War. But with health, we can have objectives that are much more important than the political differences. And so that's what uh, WHO has to keep emphasizing, what we have to keep emphasizing, that we're willing to work with anybody in order to improve health. Yeah, and so uh, as we wind down, uh, and we had sort of last five minutes uh, uh, of our time, um, you know, I would love for you to sort of talk about, um, you know, about what advice uh, would you share uh, with early career investigators, young professionals, aspiring public health professionals, et cetera, because a lot of them are part of our audience, uh, as students and early stage faculty and, and others. Um, and, and I will share a personal uh, uh, anecdote. Um, when I became the Bill Fagey professor in my previous job, uh, it was almost funny uh, that, that, uh, uh, as if someone had given a form letter to people who wrote to me to congratulate. And there was one sentence that was very cons surprisingly consistent. And it was, Bill Fagey is my public health hero. Uh, and, and it was, you know, so, it, so after the first two, three emails, and these were people I respected, um, et cetera. But 
so so from that perspective of someone who has made contributions to public health, who has been witness to a lot of successes, but also a lot of shortcomings of the public health system in the US and globally, uh, what advice would you give to aspiring and early stage public health professionals and scientists? It, it's a question I like to deal with actually. And first of all, be very careful about a life plan because you can have no idea what opportunities are going to be presented to you. You have no idea what the new problems are gonna be two years from now. So be careful about uh, solidifying a life plan. Number two, I tell the students that if you go into global health, you're not likely to get rich, but you're also not likely to get thanked. <laughs> but if you can get beyond those two things, it's re very rewarding. And I tell them the story of Pearl Kendrick, who worked for the Michigan Health Department in the 1930s. And she developed pertussis vaccine with another woman working in the health department. And when she died in 1980, the dean of the School of Public Health at the University of Michigan, Bill Remington, gave a eulogy and he said, there are hundreds of thousands of people who are alive because of Pearl Kendrick. And he paused. And then he asked, could you name one? He said, I can't either. And that's why she was never adequately thanked. But he said she was secure in the knowledge of what she was doing. And so I tell students, you won't get rich, you won't be thanked, but be secure in the knowledge of what you are doing. And then I suggest to them that in any program they go into or any particular uh, project that they go into, to have uh, three things in mind. Number one, the science. And Huxley uh, defined science as simply common sense at its best. So lots of people get afraid of science these days, and you can see what's happening in this country with coronavirus, people that don't believe the science and so on. But they all think they have common sense. And so if you define science as common sense at its best, it makes it palatable. But number two, Will Durant said, add to the science art, because he said, then you have creative common sense at its best. And he uses as his example, Imhotep from Egypt, who was a physician and an artist. He designed the step pyramid and then he uh, had it built. So he says, adding art to your science gives you that creativity. But there's a third thing, and that is to add a moral compass. And Roger Bacon is the example I use from 700 years ago, when the Pope asked him for a summary of science. And Bacon worked a long time on that summary. And then he decided it's too long. And so he did a summary of the summary. And finally, he did a summary of the summary of the summary. That went to the Pope. Now, I've not looked at this for decades, but there were three things that came to mind for me. Number one, he was absolutely enthusiastic about science. He predicted planes, submarines, and cars. He predicted telescopes. This is 700 years ago. So he was very excited about it. And number two, what I recall is that after talking about the possibilities of science, he said, but science has no moral compass. So you have to create scientists with a moral compass. And the third thing, and this is what makes me think the Pope never actually read it. He said, the church is doing nothing to help them to provide a moral compass. So here we are still today, get the science right, add art, get a moral compass and put those three things together. And now you have moral, creative, common sense at its best. That's the shortest description I can make 
of what it should be like to go into global health. Thank you. Really appreciate that. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks for all your passion, wisdom, uh, and moral leadership uh, in global health for, for many decades. Um, uh, thank you to the audience who joined us today. Uh, we are hoping to, uh, uh, to, to have our fall season for the conversation series in person or at least hybrid. So stay tuned. We have a lot of exciting guests uh, lined up uh, and uh, look forward to seeing you there. Even if we do it in person, those of you who join from around the country and, and, and from various parts of the world, um, uh, you should be able to follow us online as well, even at that time. So thank you, everyone, and especially Dr. Fagan. Thank you, Sam.